you know, um, where I come from. See, you know, I'm a, I'm a little pastor, little kid. And, you know, when we, we came, came in the house of praise, even when I didn't feel like it, they caused me to do it. And I think it just helped me for my, for my todays. We gave God the highest praise. I just want to know if, if everybody willing to give God the highest praise with a mighty shout today. Amen. <laughs> Are you willing? Because, no, I went to a church. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell, tell you something. I went to a church, and it was a big church. And, um, well, this is where my journey started down here in Florida. And the word was, it was good. But the people wouldn't praise God. I mean, you're talking about 5,000 people, and the church is quiet. I wanted to shout, hallelujah! <laughs> Just to break up the atmosphere. Because for some reason, Christians get comfortable in their flesh and forget all the things God has already done for them. Looking for what God already is going to do, but forgot what the past was that he brought you out of. There should be a hallelujah in our praise. Amen. There should be a hallelujah in our heart. There should be a hallelujah in our dance. Because I don't know you about you. I know what he brought me out of. And every time I fall short, I just shake my head and remember what he already had done. I know I've seen everybody that came into this ministry. And I'm going to tell you something. Y'all all didn't come in here looking good. <laughs> Not one of y'all came in here looking like you already made it. Each and every one of you came in here looking like you was looking for somebody to give you help. First, you thought it was pastor because you were looking at man because you didn't know no better Amen. for some because some people was brought up in traditional religion. But then when you finally realized that uh, it was beyond a man and that you needed something more. And then when you got that touch, you know, when you got that gift of tongues and you thought that was strange, because I thought that was strange to me when I first, they tried to introduce it to me. I started trying to run from it for years. I ain't going to say that crazy language. You must be crazy. You sound like witches. Because I didn't understand. But then when one Friday night in South Florida, when I, the demons were beating me up so badly that I didn't know what to do, that I needed help, and I was crying out for help, I said, give me that, what you got. I need this. I need this. Because I can't defeat these things off my own strength. Amen. So when God touched me, I don't know about you, but all kinds of junk was coming out of me. And just because the stuff came out of me, I wasn't taught how to maintain. So by not maintaining it, guess who had access back into my temple? So I had a touch from God. But the enemy made me forget it. And that's what he does. He makes you forget. So what, one time, what, one thing I want everybody to do, because I said I want y'all to do a hallelujah. Let's do it all together. In a one, two, three. Hallelujah! Yeah, we just shake some demons about it. <laughs> Especially in you. <laughs> they shaking. They quaking. Because of the mighty uproar of the saints. You know, I didn't know what I was going to teach about, and I still don't know what I'm teaching about. 
<laughs> I just wait. And uh, I said, I don't know how he does this thing. <laughs> but um, we have, how many of y'all going through trials? How many of y'all going through some stuff? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. There's victory in your stuff. There is victory in your stuff. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Everyone in here should have been dead two times over or three times over. But there was a God that assigned you before the beginning of time and said, you are mine. Now, you was going through a big trial back then, weren't you? Matter of fact, you was putting yourself in the stuff that you didn't even know you was doing. Walking blinded. Even then, the enemy could not take you, take you out. He tried, promise you, he tried. He brought suicidal thoughts, he brought people, he brought people into traumas. He brought fear and he brought doubts and he brought all kinds of false religion to the people of God. And still, God made a way. He made a way so that you can come to the truth. Isn't that amazing? That his love is so real like that. So let's get, let's get started and find out about our victory. Okay? Amen. Today's teaching is called Victory Over Trials. Victory Over Trials. Because we all got a trial set before us. And just because you pass one trial, don't mean that another one ain't coming. We're going to have trials until we go home. But, we got, but the thing is, there should be victories in those trials. Let's go to Acts 19. Verse 11, Acts 19, verse 11. Glory to God. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirit went out of them. You think those people wasn't going through some trials? They was going through it. Then some of the itinerant, what's that word? Itinerant, thank you. When I was reading, I was saying, man, I can't say that word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest. <laughs> Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. It's saying, we exercise you by the Jesus who Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? One thing about being in the trial, you better know Jesus. Because you can't defeat anything in the flesh. You got to understand some. We are spirit beings. Fighting spirit beings. We came in this natural being on the earth in this flesh. But we are spirits. And the thing that a spirit wants you to do is to fear another spirit. But God let you know right now to let you remember you're a spirit first before you became this flesh. Amen? Amen? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of 
the house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, the, and all the name of the Lord Jesus was manifested. Now, just the anointing removed them. You got to understand something. We are anointing beings in this place. Each and every individual that comes through total freedom should be carrying the anointing. You should have the anointing to outwit the enemy, to overcome self, to overcome things that we don't understand. Because the anointing brings us things yet to come. Got to understand the anointing is who? The Holy Spirit. And he brings us to all truth. Amen? Amen. The power of darkness always challenges you of who you are. They will always challenge you. They always want to try to take away your identity so that you may forget who you really was called to be. We need to stay filled with the Spirit of God. Darkness hates us and wants to see you to bleed to death because they are evil. There's nothing nice about a demon. When you find a pet a demon, <laughs> it's like you're petting a rock rod that want to bite you. <laughs> you say, oh, he ain't going to bite you. <laughs> Tear you to pieces, especially if you're hungry. Demons are hungry for you. They don't sleep. So as you slumber, they're making plans on how they can do you the next day. Matter of fact, in your sleep, they're trying to get you. Because while you're resting, they bring nightmares and, and everything else, a false dream of hope. Amen? Amen? When we get into the presence of God, when we come out, we will be challenged. Because every time you get in the presence of God, who comes next? The enemy. Always trying, oh man, you didn't get that. Like, like I see guys go through deliverance. They come out of deliverance, and they're, they're healed. They're free. They had a Holy Spirit experience. And then immediately, I see the enemy take it away from them. They walk out and they go back and the enemy say, ah, oh, that was so to some. I ain't saying everybody, but to some. You can see the fruit. Because the pride comes about instead of being humble. And, they, and, the, and you can see immediately more are entering in. Because when you kick them out, they come back with vengeance. Amen? People feared these men because they had the power to overcome demons, spirits. The people are going to fear you when you have the anointing, when they're not living right. They, matter of fact, when, when you have the anointing and you're, and, and, and you're carrying it, people be careful what they say around you. <laughs> but, you know, they're like a chameleon. You ever seen a chameleon? He, 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 it goes into places and it changes. It's what it is. We have people that are chameleon that they'll come to you in one way and leave you another. They, they'll go in the world and they mix right into the world like they're not even saved. Or they go into places, uh, or they'll, they'll come to you with one thing and bring discord and leave with false information. That's a chameleon. I hate to see a chameleon. I hate them when they have to go to a gay parade <laughs> because they have many colors. They don't know what they are because that's what happens with, with this world today. The world is upside down. When you got saved, you came upside, you came upright. And people are saying, what's wrong with you? No, what's wrong with you? 
Because we don't live in the ways of the world no more. We're not even supposed to love the things of the world no more. And slowly, God is taking stuff out of me from the world. You know, things I used to do five years ago, it doesn't even appeal to me no more. And I can imagine the next year, things that's not going to appeal. Because he's trying to draw things out of us so he can draw more of himself into us. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Matthew 3. How many of y'all are looking for a victory today? Amen. How many of y'all are going through a trial today? Amen. <laughs> There's a victory coming. Matthew 3, 13. Wow, did I mess this up? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I see what I did. Praise God. I'm pastor's son. <laughs> Y'all wait. <laughs> then Jesus came to, from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be, so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, Jesus just had a big experience, a great experience. He came into his ministry. The Father spoke over him. He seen the Holy Spirit come upon him, and the living word was right there. A great experience just happened. And then, Let's move on. It says here, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So immediately, as soon as that great experience came upon him, he was immediately going into a trial. Immediately. So anytime that you go through an experience from God, expect the enemy to come immediately behind it. But he's going to try to tempt you to take away what was given to you. He's good at it. And let's see what the enemy tried to do with Jesus. He said, the wilderness, to be, and it said, and the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights after it, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, you notice that the, the enemy knows who he was. But he didn't want him to know, he didn't want him to know who he was. Because he said, if you are the Son of God. He said, you are the Son of God. Make these stones turn into bread. He said, if you are. So he challenged him of his identity. If you are the Son of God, make these stones turn into bread. He challenged them. Try to make them not believe who he was. But he said, he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. And now Jesus said in this passage, he said, man shall not live by bread alone means that Jesus was purely just being a normal man. He didn't use his powers that was given to him 
to say, look, say, now I must do this and show you. Because if he did that, then Satan would have place in him. And another thing Jesus had to do was show him that, show us that he can go through every trial like a man, like, and be the example so that we have no excuse saying, this is too hard for me, Lord. I can't do this. He said, I did it as you. So I'm the example. Follow me. So that you can overcome your tempter. Then the devil took him up upon the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. Now, Satan twists the word again. If you read in, in Psalms 91, it don't even say that. It says it's differently. But you got to understand something. He knows the word, and he knows how to twist the word to make you believe it the way it sounds. So you got to be careful. When Satan's talking, you know, I've been talking to people and say, yeah, the devil got me, got me. I said, if you know who he is, who's doing it, rebuke it. If you know, we should know when we're being tempted because it comes against the word of God. We were trained up to understand these things. We got better training than a lot of people that go going to church in 30, 40 years. We call them pew sitters. They just sit in the church and go every Sundays. They don't even come to Bible studies that they call or anything, but you see them Sundays. They have their favorite spot in the church, and they'll sit there. They'll, they have bake sales and everything else. But when it comes to fight, they do a warfare or the cast out devils out of people, everything, you don't see them. But if there's a concert, they'll come for entertainment. Yeah. 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 Then that verse 8 says, again, the devil took him up to exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. Now, this is what we should be saying. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Make sure you put that name on it. There's power in that name. It says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. During the time heaven opened up and the Father spoke, the Holy Spirit ascended, and in living word, Jesus was fully covered. Immediately his trial began in the desert. At the Jordan, his ministry was affirmed. At the desert, his ministry was attacked. For a believer, a desert experience is not an escape from reality, but it's an engagement with the eternal. Because every challenge that is met in the wilderness, God gives victory. All you have to do all you have to do is cooperate. That's all you have to do is cooperate with the challenge that's at hand. Because God wants to give you something on the other side. That's had an old teaching um, in the wilderness, through the wilderness, and out of the wilderness. And that teaching, he always said that when you come out of the wilderness, you get a, a crown. And then after you give that, you give it back to him, and you go back into the wilderness, through the wilderness, and out of the wilderness. Because of what it's doing is you go on the level to level. That means new levels, what? New devils. So why is this happening to me? It's supposed to happen to you. We're on this miserable earth. And everything ain't supposed to go your way. If it's going your way, then, there's, then that's not God. But God don't operate like that. God don't operate underneath your 
ways. He operates on the way that he put forth. A lot of times he operates in the way that you die to yourself. Let's go to Deuteronomy 20. Killing the flesh. Killing the flesh. Killing the flesh. You know, in those three areas that he was, Jesus was tempted, he was tempted through the lusty eye, the lusty flesh, and the pride of life. Now, if we can overcome the lust of the flesh, the pride of life and the lust of the eye can have no dominion. Kill the flesh. Kill the flesh. And it won't have dominion. It won't have no power. But it's our responsibility to do that. He gave us the tools. Don't pick them up and let them be rusty. He gave us a sword. Don't pick up the sword and have a rusty handle. And the sword falls off. Because you're not sharpening it. Oiling it. Getting it prepared for battle. That sword is your tongue. Speaking the word of God. You know, when you're going through stuff, you speak the word of God. Don't, and don't speak the words that are pleasing to you. Speak the words that, needs your, that you need to tell your spirit, man, to build up. Get strengthened. We're after this victory. It's like playing sports. Anybody play sports in here? Don't have to put your hands up. <laughs> you had to play according to the rules. Right? And if you didn't play according to the rules, you were not able to participate in the game. And when you came out of bounds, that means you can't play. You know, it's a good place like soccer. Soccer is a good place to show them about position. Now, here we got Pastor. He's the center. The center in soccer goes everywhere on the field, right? Then you have your forwards, and then you have your guys that play in the back, and you have your wings. Yeah, you don't think I knew about that, huh? <laughs> huh? And, then, and if you, over, if you over, go over the line, they throw a penalty, right? That's how Satan is with us. If you overstep your lines that God has given you, you allow a demon to come in and give him access. And you got to understand something. He's not going to tell you he's there. They come silently. Because they wait for the opportune time to rise up. Deuteronomy 20, everybody there? Verse 1. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. And do not tremble or be terrified because of them. The Lord, if the Lord is before you, who can be against you? Don't let your eyes, emotions defeat you. Don't let what you see defeat you for who you are. God called you to be. If God called you, he says, I called you. I know how to finish it. You might have me doing some things in your life that need to be altered, need to be checked. Me, some things need to be moved. Some things need to come in so that he can prepare you for what's next to come. 
Because everybody that came here, God has a plan for each and every one of you. Right where you're at. Right now. You don't know who you're going to meet when you walk out that door tonight. You don't know who you're going to meet somebody at a job site. You don't know who you're going to meet somebody at the doctor's office. They might need you to heal them, and, and then they go to the doctor's office, and he said, there's nothing wrong with you. You don't know. You don't know where God has an assignment for you that day. Because every day we wake up, it's a new day. There's something new that spiritually is going to happen if you're looking for it. Amen? Let's go to Psalms 18. You'll be coming out praising the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Huh? Thank you. Thank you, Father. Psalms 18, verse 20. The Lord rewards me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all my, his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquities. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands and his sight. You will receive victory in the battle. In the cleanness of your hands. In the way that you carry yourself. Because you got to understand something. When you're in the battle, it sometimes it feels like you're losing. You're really not losing. God just wants to see if you're going to trust him. In the battle. You're really not losing. Verse 37. You just want to see, are you going to trust in me? Or are you going to trust in your own strength? You're not losing. Now, like I said, all you got to do is cooperate with him. As you cooperate with him, he'll, uh, how, do we all have the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit, if you cooperate, will he lead you to all truth? So that means then you, he has a plan. So you can't go by what you see. Even though what you see, you say, Lord, don't you see this? <laughs> say, yeah, I see it. What you going to do about it? You going to look at me? Or are you going to look at that? Which one are you going to look at? I remember back when I was in the nine-month program, I didn't have nice, real nice house managers. I didn't tell these guys this. I would say, hallelujah, anyhow. It was nothing I could do. What I want to do against my authority. Hallelujah, anyhow. That means, Lord, I trust you. I, instead of going, nigga, snack a mack and knacker. Hey, we sometimes slip, don't we? <laughs> For the hallelujah. In it. The highest praise. And, and he'll say, yeah, you, you, you passed that one. But there's another one coming. Because <laughs> he got to do something. Hey, to get something, you got to do something. Amen? If you think you can't do nothing for the kingdom and receive something, then that came from the devil. Because you got to be, everyone in here is going to be persecuted. I promise you that. You're going to be persecuted. To be with Jesus, you will have to be persecuted. They say they persecuted him, and he said they will persecute you because of me.
So don't think that it's something strange when you're being persecuted. It brings growth. It brings you strength. It makes you strong and him. Verse 37. I pursued my enemies and overtake them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I wounded them so that they could not arise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with the strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies. Hallelujah. How would you like to have the necks of your enemy? <laughs> Some of y'all already got your hands around somebody's neck. <laughs> so that I destroy those who hate me. They cried out, but they, there was none to be saved. Even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind. I cast them out like dirt in the street. We're supposed to pursue the enemy to overcome. Then God exposes your enemy. You know, God can expose your enemy and you don't have to do nothing. You will know them by their fruits. That's how you know your enemy. You know them by the fruits. You know them by the food. Bad impurities and your life, we must remove. So if you have bad impurities in your life, you have to remove them. You got to get free from those things so that you can be right with God so God can fight your battles. And it's your responsibility to do these things because God said that I give you the keys. What you bind in heaven you to bind on earth. What you bind on earth, you bind in heaven. When he said heaven, he means spiritual. Because we do not fight against flesh and blood. But we fight against spirits. Spirits within and spirits that's outside of us. Amen? John 15. Everybody okay? Amen. Is anybody getting this? Okay, we'll see. We'll be, I'm a fruit inspector. I will be pushing buttons. <laughs> see what comes out. <laughs> Hallelujah, anyway. Mom knows that. <laughs> Say it all the time. You need to get back to basics. Sometimes you got to get to ba back to basics. To get, you know, when you play sports and you start doing things and you're fumbling, what do they, you have to do? Get back to basics, to do the fundamentals, to get back sharpened so you can get your tools back the way they're supposed to be. Amen? So sometimes you got to go back to basics to get sharpened up and come back back out. Because you got to remember your identity. You got to remember who you were called to be. Don't let the enemy trick you and tell you who you're not supposed to be. You can't go by what people say about you. If God called you, he called you. Now you cooperate and fulfill it. It's not going to be easy. I promise you that. It's not supposed to be easy. If it was easy, the world would be doing it. You're a peculiar people. You're not, people in the world will be saying, man, I've been gone. Matter of fact, people that come through this ministry go because they can't have it their way. Because things didn't go the way that they planned. 
And then they find out when they go out there, the picture changed, and they don't fit in it. Because the little time you stay in here, God puts something in you. Sometimes it could be conviction. I can't stand it. Praise God. I don't know how fast to do this thing. But praise God, I got to think. Okay, John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and the fruit father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So who's doing the pruning? Jesus. He's doing the pruning. He said, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken in you. That means to you. That means came in you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch can not bear fruit. Of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he has, is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciple. Huh. The key word, disciple. That means that you will have to be disciplined. That means that he will purge you. He will take stuff out of you. And all this is saying is, if you cooperate with me, then I can cooperate with you. It's a give and take. You give what I ask you to do, and I'll give you what you need. Because as you're doing it, you're doing his will. Because that's what needs to be done, is his will. So that means he already have the plan and the roadmap set out for you. All he wants you to do is follow his lead. He ain't going to tell you there's going to be some trials over there. <laughs> he wants you to follow his lead. He ain't going to tell you there's going to be some bumping and bruises on the road. Everybody wants the smooth path. Because <laughs> the word says the smooth path, right? <laughs> So God said, a smooth path, so I shouldn't be going through all this stuff. Really? Now, how are you going to become the character of Christ? How are you going to become a disciple that he called you to be? But you got to, in the military, we're in the military. You're going to have to get some discipline. When, we went, when I was in the military... They did cadence. And I couldn't understand why we got to do these cadence in the rain. Why we got to do cadence in dry land? Why we got to do cadence climbing rocky mountains? I was in Georgia, and mountains don't stop there. <laughs> it was to discipline you so that when battle came, you don't go and say, well, I think we should do it this way. And I think we did. No, I think we need to do it this way. No, no you go, yes, sir. Yes, sergeant. You move. Because there was no time to reason. It was time to take a command and go. Because your life depended on it. And not only yours, but your battalion. Amen? Now, fruits, something of being obedient to. That's what fruits are. There's something to be obedient to. We are being pruned through our suffering. You may as well enjoy it. Amen? Amen. 
This is part of sowing to become a dis- discipline of the image of Christ. The purpose of pruning is to perfect, bring abilities, to test, to humble you, expose your garbage, and to keep yourself. This involves chastening. He says he chastens those he loves, don't he? Are you still disciplined? Because sometimes he just put a check there to see, are you still disciplined? Let me see if you know you're, you're out of order. Let me see if you, are you still disciplined? And he'll put something there to see. And then if you see yourself not disciplined, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to get back in position? Or are you going to go more outwardly? Are you still waiting? Are you still dying? Are you being strengthening? So we can flow to every command. So we can flow like a good engine. Engine that got good oil, it runs perfectly. With all the mechanics working together, everything works. We're supposed to be oiled, oiled up. So when that fire comes, we can handle it. I'm going to show you. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 6. God be the glory. Second Corinthians. Like I said, I don't know what I was teaching on. God knows. Second Corinthians six verse one. When then as a worker together as him and also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he said, In the sensible time I have heard you, and in the days of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the scepter of time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience and tribulation and needs and distress and stripes and imprisonment and tumults and labors and sleeplessness and fasting by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold, we live. As chastened and yet not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. As having nothing and yet possessing all things. As a servant of the Lord, you're going to go through stuff. And we don't have, and you don't have a life. You don't have a, I don't have a life. My life is to do God's will. Period. Despite anything else that comes my way. Trust me, I have opportunities that come my way. And I have to cancel them out. The enemy say, man, you could do this and do that. Because I remember. I remember the call. As a matter of fact, when I did get called, the enemy came right behind it. The enemy came right behind when I was called. Right behind it. Immediately. I to keep denying it. Even when my flesh said, man, you, you tired. You can do something else now. Delete the call. I have to delete 
the voicemail from the enemy. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. <laughs> Got to delete it, man. There's a price to pay. Again, count it all joy. <laughs> the greatest price to pay is deny thyself. Delete that button. That's the delete button. Delete, delete, delete. Somebody you got to sing. Delete, 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 delete. <laughs> got to enjoy it. <laughs> uh, let's go to John. John 11. You got to understand something. I've been running from the Lord most of my life. Most of my life, I hated Jesus. I didn't want to be a part of no Christianity. I wanted to be in the world. I wanted to get high. I wanted to do drugs. I wanted to do my thing. That was me. But, you know, everywhere I went to, it seemed like Jesus came out of my mouth. I'd be in the crack hole. I'm talking about Jesus. I'd be in the bar. I'd be, all of a sudden, he come out of my mouth. Couldn't get rid of him because I was brought up in him. But I didn't want him at the time. Now I look back and I, and I thank him for all the times that he looked over me when I didn't want him. Because I didn't know, the, I believed in the lie. Because the lie looked so good. It, was sound, it, it sounded so real. You know what? It's a, human mankind always wants to hear the lie anyhow. It's, that's right, it's nature. It's pleasing to us to hear the lie and to accept it. It takes discipline to shun the lie and to hold on to the truth. Because the lie sounds so good. Satan pictures it real good. He's good at it, ain't he? Man, he got that video camera and he goes, and he gives you vision. Next thing you need to follow on it. Right into a ditch. Amen? Because it sounds good because you don't want to go through the suffering. Because suffering is painful. How come they can do what they can do and have fun and, and everything else and I got to stay here and do this, here, this thing? Because I called you. Because they don't know no better. They go by their emotions and their feelings. You have to reason by truth. My truth will save you. It will keep you. It will hold you. It will take you places that no man can go. You will see people delivered and healed and free as you're getting free. Where we at? John what? 11, verse 34. I remember when I came through Total Freedom, the pastor used to keep a tight grip on me. He wouldn't let me go. Like, everybody going furloughs? He said, why do you need to go out there? And I used to get so torn because everybody was able to go to the movie and everything else, and he would keep me right there. But most of those guys are dead. And I'm dead too, but in a different way. By me cooperating and dying. And it didn't feel good, man. But so what you know what I did? I ran in my prayer closet. Because that's the only place I knew where to go. 
But that's the only place that I got healing. That's the only place that got me freed from my past. That's the only place I knew how to cry and let go and be real with him. Because he knows already. He knows everything about me. He knows my being. He knows my enemies. He knows my, my friends. He knows who's, who's with me and who's against me. He knows who's smiling in front of me and stabbing me in my back. That's life. Get used to it. Got used to it in the world. And now I'm getting used to it. And see, the thing was, when I came to the Christian fold, I thought Christians were going to be Christian. Hallelujah. But I found out there's different levels of Christians. <coughs> You're going to have some that half believe. You're going to have some that really believe. And then you're going to have some that are true believers. They know how to, they know how to uh, look at the people as they see Christ in them themselves. And respect other people as they want to be respected. I had to learn that. Because I came here hard. I had to learn how to be soft. Be willing to yield to what the Holy Spirit says. Because when you come hard, you break. But when you come soft, you're flexible. And you'll be able to go wherever the Holy Spirit leads you. Like an eagle in the, in the winds. They're guided by the winds of the Lord. This is a long race, man. You don't know what tomorrow brings. <coughs> tomorrow could bring anything. Just because it's fine today don't mean that tomorrow something is going to be devastating. Life is not no promises to you. You're not supposed to be getting prepared. We're supposed to be prepared. In this kingdom here, in this place, we're supposed to be prepared. We don't know what's coming. Well, we do know what's coming because the Bible tells us. Well, we're supposed to be prepared for what the coming of it. Because this world is upside down big time. Big time. It's a shame, too. 50 years ago, People were flipping over their graves if they see how this world is today. You got men being women, women being men, and it's coming more and more about this. They're teaching it in the schools. They got programs for whatever these things are. They come into your classroom and teach these kids that they don't have to be what God created them to be. You remember I told you, people like to hear the lie. And Satan knows that. Where are we at? 34. And he, okay. And he said, where have you laid him? And he said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then Jesus, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Wow. They, so they was challenging Jesus. They said, you can open the, bl the blind man, but you can't do this here. They, for they, they forgot his identity. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb it was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, who was dead, of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where 
the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you, and you have heard me, and I know that you will always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe you that you sent me. Now, when he and said this, these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And when he who had died came out, bound, hand wrapped with clothes, Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Now, staying in the spirit, you must make a conscious effort. The total fight is to trust in God, believing he will finish what he started. The stone represented a hardened heart where it's being stenched. And the belief was to just trust, just do it. Just do it. Let's go one more. I got plenty more, but I think I'm going to stop right there. Let's go to Daniel. Three. Oh, Daniel. Now, Daniel had to be a, a real believer, didn't he? Huh? How many of y'all would be kicking and screaming going to the line then? Huh? Seriously, these things are not fairy tales. These things truly happened to the saints of God. You know, the word said that they're going to throw us to prisons and everything else. This is, these things are happening already in different countries. People are getting beheaded because of the name of Jesus. They tell people to deny the name of Jesus or we're going to cut your head off. And people are standing up. It was a standard of righteousness for him. And they, you got to understand, they know their true identity because they know they're not going to die. They know that you might take this body, but I'm a spirit being going home. Going home. Daniel 3, verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression of his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they, they, they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, you got to understand, I'm going to stop right there real quick. You got to understand something. They was in the trial. The king said, that when you hear the sound of the bong, bong, everybody bow down to this idol. And Meshach and Abednego and who else was it? Shadrach said, ain't no way. I, I know who my God is. And he said not to bow down to what? No idols. Now, this is what puzzles me. The, the guys came to the king and told him that these guys are standing up. Now, you got to remember, there was a, a point in office. But these guys came to the king and said, these guys are not bound to the king. What puzzles me is, how did they know? If everybody's supposed to be bowing down. You think about that. How do they know? If everybody's supposed to be bowing down to this idol, how do they see them standing up? Could have been some jealousy there? Envy? So, let's go on with the story. Because, because they didn't bow down, the king was furious. The word says that the king's face changed. You got to understand something. That demon expressed himself. Because it was not doing what the devil wanted done. And so he said, heat the fire seven times more. Didn't know that seven times meant my daddy was coming. 
<laughs> that means something perfect and complete is about to happen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Verse 20. And he commanded certain mighty men and valors who were in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, and their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king commanded was urgent and the furnace was seeming hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down the bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, was astonished, and he rose in the haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. They are not burnt, and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Yeah, I knew that blew his mind. It had to blow his mind. You understand something? When you're going through, you know, we could be talking, we'd be saying fire fall down and fire this and fire that and this in this, in this place. So when God released fire and that fire come, people be going, why is this happening to me? <laughs> Didn't you ask for fire? <laughs> that means James 1 says, James 1 says, even though when you fall into various trials, count it all joy. You got to remind yourself who you are. You gotta understand something. When he saw them in the fire, if they was stand, if they was walking, really they was really dancing in the fire. They put them in there bound up. Everything that bound them was loose. It was free. Because Jesus was there. He was able, and he called them forth, and he told them to come out. And, he, and the king said that because what they did and stood for the standard for God, it changed the king's heart. And the king said to them, it's in the verses, but I'm not going to go there, but it says, you can read in number four, that if anybody come against these guys, God, or speak about them, they'll be cut to pieces. So by standing up as a standard and having victory, it brought another one in. You don't know your victories by you going through your trials. You're bringing somebody else in. But no, it doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to go by how you think. The word says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Now to know thy ways. He'll direct it in the way that it needs to go. Got to cut your heads off, my brothers and sisters. Be a headless soldier. So you'll be able to walk in victory through your trials. Amen?